Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me tell you a bit more about who we are and what we are up to. So Quantstack is a team of open source developers working in scientific computing software. Uh, the software that we built is generally in the Jupyter ecosystem. The team comprises core developers of several packages uh, of, on sub-projects of Jupyter and other tools such as kernels, visualization libraries, and, and whatnot. Um, so we are based in Paris, and we are a distributed team uh, that's fairly international. Uh, so if you're looking for experts in the field, uh, reach out to us, and we'll be happy to, to, to respond. Um, so Project Jupyter was really meant to be a set of tools to improve and unify scientific computing workflows. So it's an interface between metal and humans, flesh and metal. So from day one, it was developed by scientists for scientists and educators. And it really shines at interactive workflows. So programming language, they're not only used to build systems and complex uh, machineries, but also to explore and gain insight on a computing resource, a data set, the outcome of a simulation. So interactive workflows like generally works this way. You load some data, you run some code, you uh, show a visualization and run some more code and you loop over, right? Um, well, the C++ programming language is really strong in the scientific computing ecosystem because it was really tailored for performance, it has a massive community, and they are especially strong in HPC. But it lacks a good story for interactive computing, and this hurts productivity of C++ software developers. So C++ is generally considered a difficult programming language to teach and learn. Um, it has a fairly heterogeneous set of tools that don't always play well together, and it makes scientific workflows harder to reproduce. So that's why we decided to uh, attack this problem, and we developed the Xus Kling C++ kernel. So it, it is actually a kernel for Project Jupyter that allows you to use the C++ programming language in the Jupyter Notebook and other tools. So it's built upon the Xus library. What Xus is, is a modern C++ implementation of the Jupyter protocol. It is not a kernel itself. It is a library meant to build kernels. So there are a number of kernels that were built with Xus. One is the one that we're going to present today, but there is also another R kernel called the Juniper kernel. And there is an alternative uh, Python kernel being currently built at Kitware. And so Xus clean uses Xus for the Jupyter kernel protocol and the clean C++ interpreter uh, that comes out from CERN. Uh, so I'm going to leave the stage to the team now and let you let them present uh, Xus clean and a few other tools that we've built upon it. So thank you, Sylvain, for this nice introduction. Now let's uh, jump into the pool and see how we can use this uh, nice Xus Clean kernel. So the first thing you want to do when you do some interactive workflow is just be able to print things. So in C++, that means be able to see out and see error. So obviously it works. Uh, it might be long to type if you want just to inspect some variable. So we can just define variable. And then if you omit the last semicolon, you get the content of your values here. Let's go further. You can inspect more complicated objects. So let's say a map. Uh, I don't know, guys, if you use debugger like on IDE, but trying to get values of map inside Visual Studio is just a nightmare. So you have to go through a lot of uh, internal uh, structures. So here, just far way simpler. Uh, this switch output uh, can be used to. Uh, whoa, whoa. Sorry, just I'm already finding a new. Okay, we don't care. So that was map. Uh, we can also use that rich display for image. So uh, here I'm just applying an image in the notebook. It's quite simple. So basically, we just define a small function here called the mime border representation. So you can define your own for your own objects. And just return uh, a JSON object based on what you, how you want to represent things and uh, get a rich display output. So that's for the display. Now, obviously, as a C++ kernel, it's just supporting all the features of C++. So you can define functions, use them, of course. Uh, you can also define a class, like foo class, uh, with a print function. Words. 
We support polymorphism, meaning I can define an inheriting class from foo and overload the print behavior. So here I'm, we just print a uh, bar value inside of foo value, so it works. Uh, okay, I won't dive into details. We support templates and template specialization. We support also uh, most of the modern C++ features, so basically uh, move semantics. We support uh, auto uh, new syntax and a lot more like Lambda, universal references, and everything. Another thing that is missing uh, in most of the IDs is inline documentation. Just you don't want to switch tabs or go on a gross thing, so we provide a question mark thing. And then it's just keeping uh, taking documentation on red docs. So you got a real web page here, so I can just scroll down. I can uh, follow link to see what's in the documentation. And you can extend and add your own files for documenting your own libraries inside Google Screen. It's really simple. Our last feature that is present in most of uh, all the modern IDs is tab completion. So here, I can just hit the tab key and uh, complete foo with uh, something like foo11 and do whatever I want. Oh, sorry. Yeah, basically. So that's for the Zeus clean. So now uh, research, science, research engineers, scientists are happy. They can just interact and uh, explore the problem. Teachers are happy. They can just teach C++ without having uh, students to install a lot of uh, tools to just be able to compile things. So they start to interact with their programs. And quickly, they want to do some uh, scientific computing. So they need some scientific data structures. And that's what uh, Wolf is going to show you now. Thanks. So yeah, <clears throat> we've developed a solution for that. And uh, the name is Xtensor. And what Xtensor is, when you, uh, the short pitch is Xtensor is NumPy in C++. And uh, Xtensor is basically a library for, for people who build libraries. So you can use Xtensor to build your numerical algorithms and your high performance computing uh, stack on top, of, on top of this library. And Xtensor is a couple of things. And uh, Xtensor is fast, for one. And uh, it's fast because of what? Because it's easy to use and it's very familiar. Because we stick with the NumPy API for the most part. And uh, most of the, uh, like a lot of the data scientists nowadays are really familiar with the NumPy API. And people coming from MATLAB are also pretty familiar with the NumPy API. And so we keep the same concise syntax and the same uh, abstractions that you get in the NumPy API, plus we uh, emulate concepts like the views that you have in NumPy, which are super convenient, and the broadcasting. But at the same time, we are aiming for speed. So we, Xtensor is an expression template-based library, so uh, we fuse all the loops, etc. And it's lazy. So Xtensor is fast to execute. And we benchmark a lot. We have a friend, uh, his name is Serge, and he developed the uh, Python, uh, transpiler from Python to uh, C++ and from NumPy to C++. And so he made a big benchmarking suit and we are trying to uh, compete with him. And as you can see, we are already doing a lot better than Python and NumPy and we are working our way up to the top in these benchmarks. And Xtensor is fast to extend. <coughs> and with that, I mean that Xtensor is not just a monolithic package like some of the traditional uh, libraries that you have for uh, um, HPC and linear algebra in C++, but rather Xtensor comprises of a lot of uh, smaller packages. So one of the foundational packages of Xtensor speed is XSIMD, which offers uh, parallelized algorithms on, on the standard math functions and uh, the arithmetic functions. So for example, we have a parallelized uh, implementations of trigonometric functions, etc. And then we have Xtensor Blast, which uh, builds a bridge to the existing BLAST libraries with their high performance uh, matrix products and dot products, etc. We have Xtensor IO, which makes it super simple to, uh, in, to import and export images or audio files or NumPy data. And there are some third party packages like Xtensor Interpolate and FFTW, which offer interpolation of splines or um, fast Fourier transformations. And there's a growing ecosystem of third-party libraries which are starting to use Xtensor, like machine learning libraries 
or finite element methods, new data formats, etc. They are all building uh, their um, ideas on top of Xtensor. And Xtensor is also C++ first. We we want we don't want to repeat the mistake of building a library that should be foundational, that is not usable from the from the implementation language itself. So, for example, uh, NumPy's uh, core algorithms are not super easy to use from C, from the C side, but we want our library to be super easy to use from the C++ side itself. But we also say that Python, Julia, and R should come first because we want the entire ecosystem <coughs> to be able to use our libraries. And we built this box with the interoperability in mind. And uh, what's in the next container? So with X container, you get, <coughs> which is the base class of all our um, data structures. You get native support for row major and uh, column major data storage. So for example, C and Python are using row major, and column major is used in Julia and MATLAB and Fortran, etc. And you have a couple of different um, data structures to st store your shapes in, which allow for really uh, strong optimizations in the C++ compiler. And I'm gonna demonstrate you a bit how Xtensor looks similar to NumPy. So here we're just uh, using the Xus Kling <coughs> notebook, and I'm, go I'm going to uh, create an X array from an A range. Uh, people who know NumPy know what an A range is, just a linear vector of numbers from uh, zero to 20. Then I'm gonna reshape it to a matrix three by three, and then I'm gonna use some function on it. So I'm multiplying uh, with two and then taking the sign of it. And then I can define another X-ray, which has three elements and is one dimensional, and then I broadcast it over, over the defined matrix with the same broadcasting semantics as NumPy has. Or we can take a view on this uh, function actually and extract the column of it. And now what we also can do is we can write the uh, functions so here I'm defining a function that uh, computes the sum of uh, signs. So I have an expression here to compute the sign of uh, our input, m. And then we, we could use the uh, um, extender function, which is called sum, just like a NumPy. Or we can use uh, SCD, uh, functions from the C++ SDL, just like uh, SCD accumulate <coughs> from the begin to the end uh, um, iterator. So f people familiar with C++ know and love this. And now we can call this with, uh, with an A range and we get uh, the correct result. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna write this into a demo C++ CPP file and export it. So I've overwritten a demo CPP with this uh, function definition and I'm going to uh, all the kernels. So all the kernels is actually a kernel multiplexer. So what we have here is we can uh, run any kernel that I have installed. So with this line and at the top, I define that I want to run this cell in this Kling uh, CPP 14. And what I'm doing here is I uh, include the demo CPP file that I just created in the other notebook, and I write some stuff, and I call it with the A range again. And you see it's executing, it's compiling and executing, and it, we get the same result as before. So now uh, I was trying to, I will try to demonstrate the integration that I was talking about. So here we see uh, some code uh, for Python. We want to ex export this function now to, to the Python runtime. So we can use extend the Python and the PyBind 11. And I'm gonna um, <coughs> append this uh, wrapper code here with the PyBind 11 module. I'm defining an XPython module, I import NumPy, and I define the sum of signs function here on a Py array. And with this, I've, uh, now I see the, I've written the file. Now we see, uh, we execute the Python 3 um, cell here. I'm gonna uh, use bash to compile, the bash magic to compile with uh, GCC. And I can import uh, xpython here. I can import the sum of signs function and call it on the NumPy A range. So this is seamless without copying the buffer of uh, NumPy. We have uh, the same results and that makes for high speed. Now we can do the same for R. For R we're using a different package called RCPP, which makes it super simple. Uh, we have extensor R and RCPP. We again define the sum of signs function here. We take as an input an R array. Um, I call this. I use source CPP to in import the just written uh, XR file. And I can call it with this is the R for A range, the R code for A range. I call it over this array and I get the same result again. And now, just to demonstrate that we can do the same with Julia as well. For Julia, we're using CXX wrap. And it takes a bit to compile again, but here we go. 
So we have made one function that we can call from three different languages of data science. So um, all of the people that love code and text are happy now, but uh, sometimes you gotta have some visualizations to justify your existence to the management, so. So an important part of uh, the Jupyter ecosystem uh, is uh, the, the inter interactive widgets. So we wanted to have um, C++, C++ widget as well. So basically, how HyperWidget is, um, is implemented is we, you have um, a Python model, which is a, a thin part of uh, the implementation, and you have um, a thick part of the implementation, which is the front end. So in C++, we could, for example, reuse um, all the front end part and only implement uh, the models. So that's what we did with uh, XWidget, which is uh, the C++ backend for HyperWidget. So I'm going to show it to you right now. Sorry. So XWidget, um, I can, for example, create a button in C++. So I link um, a callback to this button. Um, and in this callback, I will change the description of the button. So if I click on it, it changes. I can create um, a numerical widget like that. So I can change the value from the, the, the back end. And it works. I can also change it from the front end and get access to it on the back end. Um, I can also use uh, the XImage widget to load an image. And I could use uh, Extensor, for example, to filter this image. So here I create um, uh, a progress bar to see the progress of my, of my computation. Sorry. Here it goes. So I, I used an edge uh, detection uh, algorithm using uh, Extensor. So once we had that, uh, we wanted to implement uh, the C++ backend for also bqplot, ipileaflet, um, Py3.js, other widgets libraries. So I'm going to show you Xlifflet right now, which is uh, the C++ backend for IPyLeaflet. And uh, IPyLeaflet is, um, is um, a dynamic map visualization in the notebook. So here in C++, I can create a map, for example. And I can interact with it. I can create a slider if I want and link this slider to the zoom level of the map. I can add new layers, a marker. OK. Um, I could also create a heat map on the map. Here, I create some random data using an std vectors, and I add it to the map. And because now C++ is interactive, I can create a for loop and update this heat map dynamically. So we also have a velocity layer, which allows you to uh, display streams, like a wind stream or uh, ocean streams on the map. So here I load a JSON file, which contains my data. And I add it to the map. So in IPyLeaflet, what we have is um, uh, we have X-Array, which is a library built on top of Pandas, which allows you to um, create data frames and feed the, the data of the velocity layer uh, with it. Um, 
So in C++, we don't have a data frame library. So we decided to implement, to, we started to work on what we call X-Frame. And uh, Johan will, going to, will, go to, will be going to show you. So X-Frame is the last beast created at Quantstack. So it's basically a C++ data frame library. It's based on Xtensor. And it's really inspired from both Pandas and X-Array. So it's based on Xtensor, of course. And it's currently really in alpha stage, so please do not just uh, add for a lot of features for now, it's not finished. So let's show you how it works. So first I will just define a convenient type def so I don't have to type a lot. So let's start with defining uh, just an extensor of data. Uh, print it. So here, what we use as value type in our data is uh, an optional value, so we can represent missing values with a dedicated, uh, with a special object type. We don't have to use like nan or infinity for specifying missing values. We have a dedicated object for that, and which prints well, so that's not available here. So that's for the tensor. Now I get a tensor data. I can add to it a coordinate system. So basically, I can define an axis, so here time axis with some dates, or I can build my axis. Direct, directly in place when I build my variable. So just like the city axis here, okay. Let's build the variable and then let's print it. So here I get a nice display of my data. So we're using the rich rendering uh, feature of the existing kernel again. And we can over, uh, over the data and see the name of dimensions, here the date and here the city. We can do some fancy selection. So, so I want to select the city London and uh, the 4th of January of this, of, uh, this year. If I know the position of the dimension inside my uh, coordinate system, I can just use locate and omit the name of the dimension. Close to. So it's quite. It's not so verbose for C++. I mean, people are always complaining that you need to type a lot when you're doing C++. Yeah, it's quite similar to what you would type uh, with Xarray in Python. Same for the, yeah, you can print uh, missing values. Another feature that's quite different uh, in uh, X-Ray compared to NumPy is the way you broadcast. So in NumPy, you broadcast according to the position of the dimensions, while in X-Ray, you broadcast according to the name of the dimension. So that's something we'll replicate here in X-Frame. So uh, let's define a one-dimensional variable. So just have the CT axis here. Uh, I just repeat the right temperature so you see it's not a gimmick and uh, we see that I'm going to operate on two variables, so one two, di one two dimensional, one one dimensional. So just computing the water vapor pressure, just complicated formula involving these two variables. And then I can print the results. So here I got a result, nice results and then two D variables where the broadcasting happen in a like it should be. I mean, if we hadn't that mechanism, since uh, TTE is the first axis, while well, it's the second one for this variable, we would have a broadcast error. So just prove that it works well. Of course, we support higher dimension. So let's define three dimensional data. So here, for those familiar with pandas, it's quite similar to printing. Uh, when you use a multi-index in pandas, right? And still the over works. We can select uh, depending on the labels and uh, dimensions. And the last tool that, uh, last feature that was developed by Martin is a nice uh, masking feature. So let's say I want to select data based on some uh, property on their labels and dimensions. So here I want to select all the data for whose uh, x values, the x label sorry, is uh, not equal to two and the z value is less than two. So I can define a mass pressure. Then I can just try to show it. And so here's the result. So all the values that do not satisfy, whose coordinate system do not satisfy the previous condition are just filled with uh, missing values and the other just the data. So that's it for X-Frame. Um, 
all these libraries are not developed by only the four of us, so we are many to collaborate on this ecosystem. So the four of, four of us you already know. Uh, there is Patrick Boss who developed the XFFT Extensor XFFT module that Martin used in his demonstration. Uh, Louis Guarin, who is a research engineer at Ecole Polytechnique and uh, has contributed a lot to uh, ExoSkling development, especially the um, documentation features and also the uh, completion, a lot of other things. Martin Butters, that you should all know. If you don't, just go and see his talk tomorrow, which is amazing. We present uh, high high volume and a lot of new features. And Roman Manego, who is uh, one of the core developers of the BQplot uh, package. Uh, of course, of all of our projects are open source, so you can find them on GitHub under the Quantstack organization. And most of them are documented, so documentation are available on Redux. If it's not documented yet, it's just that it's not finished and we have some features to add before doing the documentation. So that's concluded our sh demonstration of today. So we're now happy to answer questions if you have. And thank you for your attention. Well, there are actually two cases. The first one is teaching. So if you want to try start to teach C++ to beginners, you first have to teach them IDDs, compilers, linkers, and then since they all have different platform, you have to teach them CMake, and just a nightmare. So it's faster to just open a notebook and start coding and see what happens. I mean, we are C++ teacher, and we use it in our day-to-day -day work, teach teacher work. That's the first case. Another case is prototyping in C++. I mean, you want to see if something works great or how it interacts or whatever. Instead of starting to code a make file or CMake or whatever or setting up projects, you can just open a notebook, start prototyping, and then you can backward this code to your library. So that both most uh, useful use case I see for now. Maybe, I don't know if you see other use case guys. Yeah. Uh, as C++ developers, we found that where I should probably speak in the mic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, even in the very early stages of the development of Xuse Clean, uh, when it was not even printing in the notebook, but in the console where we were running the kernel, we started using it for ourselves because it was faster than setting up a main project and anything. When we wanted to have a quick check on, is this valid in C++? Is it allowed to specialize a template in that way? I would just go to the notebook right away. And there I already have all my libraries loaded and everything. So if you are doing a native development, that's one other. I don't think that many people will actually do interactive uh, exploratory analysis in C++, although people at CERN do it, so some crazy <laughs> folks do it. And the last use case is for those who actually do write extensions for the interpreted languages of data science, like Julia, Python, and R, and what Worf demonstrated is that Extensor makes it really easy to write a software once and expose it to all these languages in a single fashion. Uh, what do you mean by the Python question mark? Okay, can you? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've done it. We've demonstrated it. <laughs> yeah. So you do question mark uh, std vector, for example, yeah. to get the CDP reference for std vector. Then you can use it like any website, click on the operator, figure it out. Yeah, so we can also do the same for Xsensor, for example, because you add a tag file. Yeah, but we showed that in the demos. So there is a, uh, it's an extension point. So you can, uh, as a library author, 
uh, in your make install statement for that library, you can uh, make it also install some uh, manifest explaining where to fetch the documentation for the types defined in that library. So it's really easy to extend with your own user-defined types. Oh, so we provide Conda packages, so it's easy to install. Uh, the thing is, uh, you have when you build the the kernel, you have to use the same uh, standard library, C standard library, as the one you used to build Kling. So you need to be sure that all your environment is consistent. So that's why we prefer to just build that as a Conda package and distribute it, than requiring people to try to install and compile it because it's really complicated to to do. Um, so I don't know if that's the question that you. Yeah, that's right. So it's the clean interpreter that is developed at CERN perform a form of like in kernel compilation. Um, it also tries to recover from errors. If there is a compilation error, it's tried, it will try to remove, like delete the symbols that it created as it was compiling, but it does not always recover well from like complicated compilation errors. And yeah, so uses LLVM and Clang under the hood. Yeah. Uh, versioning of libraries or? So I think there are multiple aspects to it. So first in terms of version of the language, we offer multiple kernels, uh, one for C++ 11, one for C++ 14, and one for C++ 17. Um, in terms of versioning, as in version control of the notebook, uh, that's just like any Jupyter notebook for other programming languages. And as far as the package management is concerned, uh, as we have been relying heavily on the Conda package manager, which is, um, I would say, uh, general purpose and not just for Python, and has been great for us. So it's just like any um, uh, kernel. Uh, it's, a kernel is merely an executable that speaks an inter-process communication uh, protocol uh, based in ZMQ. Uh, the way uh, kernels are declared to Jupyter is through a kernel spec that is a manifest of specifying where the executable is and how it should be called by Jupyter. And to install that thing, so we do it automatically when you install the Conda package for the environment of the Conda package. But you can also run the Jupyter kernel spec install if you want to install it for another environment. Does that answer your question? Or? Okay. Yeah. What uh, impact do you anticipate having a, a you know a systems language? Well, SQL, right? <coughs> having on the broader Jupyter ecosystem as. Uh, some of these things are, are made available, right? What, what reverberations do you want to see outside the projects that you guys are working on currently? What, what other implications all of this has? Uh, the first, Xeus, the, I think is going to be used for other things than the C++ kernel. So uh, that work is sort of uh, transversal, I would say. Uh, we have a different uh, concurrency model than the classical implementation of the Jupyter kernel that will help with the debugging story. And so that's why work on Xeus based Python kernels and R kernels uh, are going to be important. So that's one. Um, and um, like also, um, maybe it, it will probably also have a like smaller uh, footprint on the system because it's lighter weight than the Python kernel. Uh, yes. Uh, so on your prototype side of things, if I have a large set of uh, libraries that you know, we already developed and I, I want to prototype some new stuff on top of them, is it as trivial to include the link to those libraries as the SDK would work? Yeah, there are some uh, short primary instructions you can use to other your own libraries. 
So we do it in our demo with uh, loading some uh, extensor I/O stuff and something like that. So it's quite pretty easy to use. So there is some binary compatibility constraints. You need to have them built with a fully like a binary compatible version of the C runtime. And um, one thing that's really uh, convenient is if you need to load a runtime, is to add the clean pragmas in your headers for the loading so that it gets loaded as you hash include the header. And that makes like the, the usability similar to, I mean, the experience similar to importing a Python package. So to, to that end on the packaging, um, would you imagine that if you wanted to take existing great open source C++ libraries, of which there are many, um, would you then be able to, just with patches, do some of those things that you're describing? So you can have a you know, Zeus insert library here that it's the same, but you've done these few things. That or maybe they would consider patches, like people contributing, adding the pragmas, which are clean specific and would not have an impact for the users to these libraries. Or you can always make your own magic header that does it and includes the, the relevant headers, like as you said. Well, anything Clang doesn't support is not going to work. Okay. <laughs> so that's uh, one way to answer it. Um, also, uh, there are some limitations in terms of uh, threading. Um, you can do threading, uh, but uh, you, I mean, when doing it, it's very much like in the Python kernel. I, I would say that you're also already in a, like, a concurrent environment in the kernel. So, uh, well, as you do it, you need to be aware of that, I would say. That, that answer is like... Yeah, I was going to ask a couple of questions about threads. Like, if you like, launch a number of threads, you can see this class from the left, you can see the whole thing like a kernel. You can, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> Packaging. Packaging is the hardest. Uh, it uh, takes about half of the time. Uh, pretty much as much time is devoted to to packaging as to writing code. Uh, and some aspects of the Jupyter protocol were not meant with statically typed languages uh, in mind, were not de devised. And so we we had to use some um, uh, um, template metaprogramming voodoo to, to cover uh, everything. That, that was not straightforward, I would say. So, Restart everything. <laughs> <laughs> or unless you, you want you have already declared a variable and just want to redefine it with the same type, that's possible. But if you just want to assign a new value, so you may want to like split yourselves in ways that don't require you to redefine a type and just assign new values. That's it's already simpler than the main file, I would say, but you would still need to restart the kernel a lot more than the Python kernel. Yeah. But yes. No. <laughs> no, we haven't. So the question is, have you tried to use uh, uh, frameworks to re-execute cells uh, automatically when they're based on their dependencies? And like somehow, yeah, no, we haven't done that. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.